We're gonna cleanse this Fort Lauderdale lawn with fire. You don't wanna get too close to your main fuel source. Making room for tropical fruits. Put them in an area with like full sun. Pineapple rescue 911. <laughs> Let's torch this grass to replant it with host plants for Florida butterflies. We can find plenty of native plants that look awesome. All oh, these little b Oh, yeah. This is the first time I've been deep in Florida. Have you ever been down here before? No, man. America. Florida. Beautiful Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Beautiful Fort Lauderdale. They could plant actual plants on all these embankments and stuff. The ecology and like well-being of the landscape is the last thing taken into account. It's another day in tropical paradise. So what inspired you to move down here? They don't have to use as much lotion. They live closer to the ocean. They have left the commotion of the city behind. <laughs> it looks like we'll be building a natural oasis amongst the asphalt. Travel down a road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a friend and, and a confidant. confidant. Ba, da, da. Such a chill little neighborhood in here. It's kind of nice. Oh, wow, this is a nice lawn to kill. The lawn we've marked for death belongs to Liz Durand and her boyfriend, Mark Bohane. Hello. Yo, what's going on? Hello. Nice to meet you guys. Liz works at a plant nursery where she's cultivated a growing collection of cool native plants for sale. Now Liz plans to bring her work home and build on what her parents began when they emigrated from Haiti. We've got a couple of coconut trees here. Can't be Haitian without having coconut trees. This is an avocado tree that we've had for quite a while, I remember my dad coming out during Hurricane Andrew <laughs> to try to like put some stakes on it because it was small and vulnerable. Oh, yeah. And we were looking out that window like, you're not supposed to be out there. He's like in a raincoat, like <laughs> trying to hold on to the avocado tree. This yard is already a pleasant place to be. You know, the homeowners lived there for a long time, her family's been here for a long time. They were planting fruit trees. They kind of had an innate resistance to the lawn. The, the lawn is not even that big. Still. The lawn is too big to keep on living. The turf's got to go. But anything producing fruit's going to stay. I think this neighborhood has a lot of island people. There's just mango trees oh, everywhere, yeah. avocado, banana, <laughs> yeah. everything. So That's anytime you're walking by, yeah, you can just kind of grab something. But not pineapples, at least not lately, as Liz's pineapple harvest has dwindled to nothing as it's growing in the shade. Put them in an area with like full sun and where they might get more water or something, I don't know. Okay, yeah. Uh, maybe you fertilize them too, they would probably produce fruit. Pineapple rescue, 911. That's nice to have pineapples though, yeah. That's a nice regional yeah. benefit. So the idea there being, you know, not only treating the yard as a potential native habitat restoration project, but also as a mini farm. So we're very used to taking stuff from the yard and using it, so I want to bring that back. What's the soil like? It's pretty it's sandy. Sand. Yeah. Oh, it's sand. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's nutrient poor, but it drains fast, which is good. I mean, I always associate sandy soil with being able to grow a lot of stuff, you know? Yeah, I was a little worried about that, because I was just thinking it seems like there's sand all over the place. And yeah. Stuff, you know? okay. Yeah, we were thinking it was a negative. Florida, it's like sand, limestone, and coral. Uh, um, <laughs> one of the three you get. <laughs> yeah. The sandy soil supports pollinating native plants that then play host to the reproduction cycles of native butterflies. Another cool symbiosis exists in the trees, where species have evolved to grow as epiphytes above the sandy soil. It's so humid here that you can grow a lot of epiphytes, which epiphytes are plants that grow on other plants. Now there's a diversity of unrelated plants that are epiphytic, you know, orchids, bromeliads, mosses, ferns, that's something to think about too, you know, stuff that you can plant on other plants, like the tree, like the avocado tree. It's not just about one plant species and how it looks. Like, no species is an island. Everything's part of a network. Here, like, people in nurseries especially saying, oh, like, the native stuff is boring, it's weedy. It's like, man, you just don't get it. You just, they just don't know. Yeah, and we want to break that narrative of native plants being 
weeds. Ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah like not the flowering. Weeds. They're not nice to look at. Yeah. We can find plenty of native plants that look awesome. Yeah, I would love to just see all the variety that we can bring. You know, and it's not a big yard. It's not a fancy neighborhood. If you give it some time, it'll grow over time, you know, if you're patient and really create an ecosystem that's a refuge in a sea of lawns <laughs> for all of the native birds and insects to really be able to enjoy it, but also create something that's uh, native to Florida, sustainable. So that's why it's really cool what you guys are doing, because maybe other people will see it. I just think people will be inspired, you know? And I think that's so cool, actions speak louder. And I've been talking about native plants and, oh, I hate lawns. I feel like it's just like talk, yeah. because then you pull up at my house and it's a lawn. Yeah. <laughs> um, not for long, though. Not for long. <laughs> we want to give them that creative freedom. Uh, we're not experts in this, and we're really interested to see what it looks like when you go all out. We got to kill all of this grass. Yes. All of it. I think we're going to burn it. Nice. <laughs> Insert evil laugh, right? It will be cleansed with fire! <laughs> fire is the great cleanser of the South Florida woodland ecosystem and many other ecosystems across North America. Lightning triggered wildfires and controlled burns help native plants by clearing dead organic debris, letting in light, and adding nutrients to the soil. We're going to pay homage to this natural process by setting Liz's lawn ablaze with a contraption known as the flame weeder. It will allow us to replicate what happens out in a wild Florida forest where fire helps native pine trees thrive and triggers new growth in native plants. I have never had my lawn flame weeded before. Never. <laughs> and that's what I'm looking forward to in seeing that thing uh, go up in flames. We're gonna kill this lawn. You guys are free to burn. We just gotta read through the safety instructions. Free to create. Flame weeder is a propane gas appliance. Free to design, free to plan. Have at it, right? Yes. Burn, baby, burn. <laughs> <laughs> so long as they just burn the lawn and not the house, <laughs> we'll be watching. <laughs> kind of like a push mower of fire. Now we just gotta come in here, clean up the edges. I felt like some kind of Greek goddess using this immense, powerful tool. <laughs> you don't wanna get too close to your main fuel source. That's gonna present a problem. And now once the earth has been fully scorched, we'll be able to plant a beautiful variety of native plants in here and it's gonna be so much nicer. This might just have to stay in a kill your lawn toolbox. Fort Lauderdale lawn killers Liz and Mark are basking in the glow of their first kill and stoked to see their front yard come alive as a mix of native plants and non-invasive fruit producers. And we just know that it's gonna be great. We're in such professional hands. And everyone is so passionate <laughs> about this movement and about native plants. This is not a neighborhood where someone's gonna call the cops on you. I like it here. Not a neighborhood where you're gonna get scowls from old white ladies for not having your dog on a leash. And we're all aligned in our uh, values. So really, that's, that's all we need. This is gonna be great. I got a landscaper named Dennis, super cool guy, like very aligned. All he does is native landscapes. Oh, nice. In South Florida's cookie cutter world of corporate and suburban landscapes, Dennis DeZu is a rare species of contractor who's made promoting native plants his life's mission. If you can really get a yard and it can be put together correctly, designed correctly, installed correctly, it actually in the long run will save you a lot of dollars and a lot of chemicals put in your yard. The flame waiter did a good job impersonating a forest fire, but we still need to physically remove the charred remains of Liz's lawn. We're gonna first take out all the weeds and grass that comes with it, whatever's down there, so we can start fresh. Dennis is up there with the crew side cut and just taking strips off like a South Florida hair transplant, you like know what I mean? Like he's skinning a fish. That's it. The design that I put together creates a sitting area in the middle of the yard. Around that will be a mosaic of native plants, shell mound prickly pear cactus, Opuntia stricta, a to-be-determined native epiphyte planted on the existing avocado tree. And as for the pineapple plants, we'll move them into more direct sun alongside native grasses and ground covers. Of course, making it look as cool as possible. Yeah. The ground cover is a native plant called frog fruit, and it does bring in a lot of beneficial insects. It brings in a lot of butterflies. But what do you think about epiphytes for, uh, you know, like, some of the bromeliads or the epiphytic cacti or 
orchids and stuff for any of the trees they want to keep. Now, you can't buy epiphytes here uh, because they're endangered. Whoa. Nothing native is, is, is allowed. It's because of the poaching that was going on in the Everglades. Orchid thieves are still lurking in the Everglades, so you got to be careful about where you're buying your native epiphytes. Good thing Dennis has his own private stash of sustainably grown ones. I got some native ones. Like zero graphic card? <laughs> but I'm not going to sell them. I'm just going to give them to you. There okay. you go. Oh, nice. <laughs> and that's the way. That's legal. Nice. Yeah, totally. Below the epiphytes and trees will be the unsung heroes of native plant gardens in South Florida, the mighty ground covers. Fakahatchee grass, the cocoa plum that grows more horizontally on the base of the ground. Mm -hmm. Chrysobolinus is the genus. Uh -huh. Ikako, Chrysobolinus ikako, does have a, a plum. So it is edible as well. River sage, which is a salvia, uh, have okay. that in there as a ground cover. Ground covers are a big deal because when you're taking the grass out, you need to have something that replaces it, making sure that you don't get the weeds overtaking all the plants you just put in. Mm -hmm. Looking to get schooled about the specific stars of the South Florida native plant community, Joey calls in his friend and resident expert, Lily Anderson Messick. She works with the Florida Native Plant Society. She's got a good inventory on a lot of these species, on the different types of ecosystems down here. When you think about your yard, we need to start envisioning it as a piece of a larger ecosystem. Oh, God, look at those flowers. Holy shit. Yeah, they're so gorgeous. You know, as many people know, our wildlife and our plant species, our, the biodiversity is on a steep decline. And we can change that if we change the way we view our yards. We're going to go look at some plants in a field, basically see, you know, in the few crumbs of habitat that are left, we're going to get some ideas about what might be good to plant uh, in a native plant garden. And kind of unraveling some of these native plant relationships. Mm -hmm. we got to find the right bromeliads. Here in South Florida, a lot of plants have evolved the epiphytic habit, which means they grow up in the canopies of trees without harming the trees, where they can get more light and also don't have any competition. One of those epiphytes we're hoping to see is Tillandsia fasciculata. So we hit the Coconut Creek and the Fern Forest Nature Center. You got some nice epiphytes over there, those Tillandsias. See that, see those bromeliads? Nice Tillandsia fasciculata, you see that over there? Epiphytic bromeliads. See a lot of people poach the native epiphytes. Pretty hard to procure. Dennis the landscaper says he's got one of these. But first we gotta show you how epiphytes and other natives grow in the wild so you'll see what we're doing when we're placing them around Liz's yard. Any plants that really give us a sense of Florida, that you're actually in Florida. Oh, yeah, there you go. Oh. Well, well, well. If it isn't the native Faxahatchee grass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is a nice example of the Tripsacum, Dactyloides Tripsacum, however you want to pronounce that, that's going in a yard. That's a nice, uh, nice example grass. of what it looks like once it's established. Oh, yeah, so that's yeah. the seed looking like a little yeah. corn kernel. Yeah, that's, it's closely related to corn. This is the same plant that we're trying to plant over there, you know. And we hope to encounter one more species perfect for Liz's yard. Opuntia stricta, the shell mound prickly pear. Here is the cactus is over oh. here. So this is a native prickly pear? Yes. Yeah. This sun-loving, shade-intolerant cactus thrives in wildfire-prone habitat and yards scorched with a flame weeder. Resprouting after the burn comes through. Fire so has it needs, it for needs too to long. burn. It will be cleansed with fire! We're exploring fern forests near Fort Lauderdale in search of a native cactus, which Dennis is about to plant in Liz and Mark's front yard. The shell mound prickly pear evolved in a prairie ecosystem. I mean, just like an inch of elevation change in Florida is like a totally different habitat. <laughs> this habitat is accustomed to a good cleansing by fire about every three years. So this needs a good burn. Yep. And it needs a regular burn. Things mostly burn in the fall or when? Uh, during the like late spring, early summer when the lightning oh. would be peaking. And it does have a beautiful flower on it. It fruits. Only a few months ago, there was a flower. and But now we got a fruit. Oh, I'm just spreading glockids all over the place. Glockids are fiberglass-like hairs, and you certainly don't want them lodging in your tongue. Mucusy, a little bit, slight hint of sugar. As we're leaving fern forest, Lily spots a native orchid. There's one, yay! Nice. Look at 
<laughs> nice species of habanaria. Habanaria, a little nectar spur pollinated by moths at night. Do the flowers open at night? No, they're, uh, they're already open, but they start emitting scent at night. It's always a treat to get to see one of these. Habanaria is a genus of terrestrial orchid, meaning that species in this genus grow on the ground and are more difficult to poach than orchids that grow on other plants. They mostly go for epiphytic orchids. But I'm sure people try. Yeah, people are dumb enough to try, I'm sure. They don't know nothing. We're going to get all the plants laid out and wait for Joey to get here and check it out. There is a slight delay as I fall into a trance on the forest floor. Sometimes you want to look up at the canopy, look up at the trees, and let them take you away to a peaceful place. I eventually come to at Flamingo Road Nursery, where Liz works. It's kind of a dream come true, uh, surrounded by plants all the time and uh, people who are super knowledgeable about them. It's very stimulating intellectually, just always being able to learn more about the plants. The variety is endless. Do you want to grab one of these limes for her? Yeah, let's get one for it. Xanthox lymphogara, it's a native member of the citrus family. About how big these get, like 10 feet, right? Probably, yeah, about 10, 12 feet. It'll produce little uh, beads. Yeah. Tiny, like, mini limes. Mm -hmm. The lime prickly ash is the host plant for one of Florida's most flamboyant butterflies, the giant swallowtail. She has a whole theme going on now with larval food plants. She's going to be filled with butterflies in her yard. Milkweeds are another great butterfly attractant, but not all milkweeds are equal. Some non-native milkweeds that don't die back in wintertime can actually harm butterflies by passing along deadly parasites and f***ing up monarch butterfly migration causing a lot of issues for a species that's on the brink of extinction. The monarchs, when they land on it, there's research showing that it tricks them into thinking that they're in Mexico, and so they stop migrating. You have a responsibility to plant native stuff, and that mentality is so foreign to the current American mindset, yeah. too. The native sign here. Yeah, they got some native bunch grasses. The native fakahatchee grass. Fakahatchee. Tripsacum, yeah, Dactyloides. Yeah, we've seen this. It's important to differentiate between grass and lawn. There's actually a bunch of cool native members of, of the grass family, and this is one of them. Tripsacum Dactyloides provides habitat, provides a food source for a lot of the native wildlife. Grass is good. <laughs> I'm gonna right. throw this one right here. How you guys doing? Yeah, do it this looks right good, here. Dennis. You've got a few more plants. Nice, at least for you. We're so glad that we're at the point of where we're getting the plant things right now. Get this looking beautiful for Liz. It's Fakahatchee planting time, along with the lime prickly ash. So this is a good spot for the Xanthoxylum. So if you plant it, they will come. You'll get more swallowtail butterflies around. And as you get back to the back over here, no more pineapples. We're going to repurpose them. They're going to be in a much happier place. These will take off, too, being in the sun now. Yeah. That's nice. Definitely. And, and there's the Tillandsia. Man, I love the way that you use that stump right there. Yeah, that's that was great. actually good. your yeah, idea. Yeah, that was my idea. Hey, nice job, Lily. Yeah, and you luckily had some of that Opuntia stricta, the native cactus that is also edible. It's a really good use of a front yard. Lily and I head off on another hike. Was this thing? Well, Al helps with the final planting. Even though Liz is working with a tight budget, and even though it's the dead of winter, this is going to become an important piece of the larger native plant ecosystem. All these little bits. Oh, yeah. The soil is so sandy. You could really be doing this with a baker's spatula. Getting outside in your garden, it gives you a chance to move your body. You're not just sitting at a desk all day. You just become a crumpled cashew of misery. You come outside into nature, and things open up. During our botanizing adventures around Fort Lauderdale, we encountered air plants, cacti, and orchids. They need symbiotic fungi in the soil. We also experienced all kinds of native host plants for psychedelically patterned native butterflies. What's this butterfly and what's so, this plant? This is the zamia. This is the host plant for this rare butterfly. It's commonly known as kunti. Oh, look at all the f***ing chrysalis on here. And now, like the rare Atala butterfly emerging from its cocoon on a kunti plant, Liz's yard is reborn 
right down to its eco-friendly mulch. The mulch we use is actually the ground shredded remains of an invasive plant. This is Castorina, which is referred to as Australian pine. The whole point of using mulch is that you're protecting that soil from evaporating moisture, and you're also helping that soil gain nutrients, because fungi and other microbes will slowly break that mulch down, and in doing so, they will release nutrients that can later be used by plants. The Shell Mound Prickly Pear Cactus, the River Sage, the Fog Fruit, I think Dennis came through with some really neat and uncommon, hard to find native plants. The Chrysobalanus, the Cocoa Plum. I like Liz a lot. I'm really excited about how excited she is. There's something everywhere <laughs> to look at. When I first saw the yard, I thought, this is what we see when we go out hiking through Florida. We felt like we were working with friends. Check <laughs> it out. I'm seeing different things that I've never seen before. Oh, look, they moved the oh, pineapples yeah, over there to that side. Oh, yeah. They look so much nicer here. Yeah, so the pineapples will get more sun. They'll grow a little bit bigger. Here. You can get fruit off of them. And once they actually fruit, that'll be adorable. Also adorable, the nurturing relationship between host plants and butterflies. Aw. Oh, plants give caterpillars leaves to eat, and they return a favor by pollinating their host plants as butterflies. Look yeah, at the Kunti. Yeah, it was thought to be extinct, actually, until the resurgence, the uh, landscapers started using the plant more often. The oh, wow. Atala. Yeah. 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 Um, Over here, this is a, a native member of the citrus family. It's an important host plant for swallowtail butterflies. You actually have butterfly eggs on it. already got eggs on it? Yeah, there's one right there, and there's the other. Wow. From these eggs, swallowtail caterpillars will emerge. With outer markings evolved to resemble bird poop, so the birds don't eat them. It's going to be like a butterfly rave out here. Definitely. There's going to be like a butterfly <laughs> DJ. They're going to be partying. Remember, this is January, the quietest season of all when it comes to plant growth. But instant gratification and a big reveal isn't the point. The point here is for Liz to lead other Floridians by example. I feel like this is going to be super inspiring for a lot of people. It's going to take a few years for this yard to reach its full potential, but when it does, and even though Liz was working with a tiny budget, it's going to be as much of a banger as all the other yards of other lawn killers around South Florida. And I'm really excited, too, to see, you know, a year from now, two years from now, what, it, what it's going to look like here. Cheers. <laughs> I was too aggressive. I'm that sorry. That was very aggressive. It's time to go. Yeah, let's go. Time to come out alone. Even if you have a small space, even if you don't have like a huge budget that you can still accomplish something really cool. In America.